I went to the internet today, went to go do some research on hurricanes and hurricane holes in the Caribbean. And when you go onto Noah's historical like hurricane track site, mm -hmm. like it's terrifying because you're like, well, okay, I want to know about all the hurricanes that have affected this area. And it's like, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> fuck. Today, I am working on one of my last projects on my list before we can sail off to Cuba, and that is to replace this mizzen shroud. Basically, when we dragged anchor, um, this shroud rubbed up against the uh, anchor on the bow of a boat there in the marina that we dragged into. Um, so, you know, as we talked about in that episode, we did very little damage to other boats, but this is some of the damage that we suffered. Um, the shroud is actually in pretty darn good shape. Um, it's just severely chafed on the outside and the, the areas where it's chafed are starting to rust. This is actually one of the reasons why when we re-rigged Atticus, we use stay lock fittings, specifically because they're reusable. So all you need to replace this uh, shroud is the wire and then uh, two formers and two wedges because you know the internal components are the parts that need to be replaced. So today I'm going up the mast. I'm going to uh, put a spare halyard to replace this shroud to kind of take that you know to give the mast stability and then uh, take this bad boy off, make a new one, bring it back and put it on. So that'll take me probably all day today. And it's funny because I've been dreading this project for a long time and I'm dreading it now. It's just, you gotta be real careful to do all of this just right so that you know, you're not getting the mizzen to topple over. And then on top of that, I've got to support the mast with a spare halyard, which is not is less than ideal. And then I've got to go up the mast with that spare halyard in place. So that's, uh, yeah, it's just something I'm not looking forward to doing. <laughs> but all right, let's do this. So the best way that i found to go up the mizzen mast is actually to take the main sheet off of the main boom. Um, so this block and tackle, I'm able to raise it up with the mizzen halyard, connect my bosun's chair to the bottom here, and I can actually raise myself up the mast. So I'm gonna take this bad boy off. That's the setup right there. This is the shroud that we're gonna be taking off right here, the aft starboard. So we need to get it going this way. So this is a great little strong point. I'll connect it here and I'll make a little bit of a purchase and uh, tight cinch that bad boy up. Ideally, I get this so tight that I can actually feel the tension coming off of this. That's all I'm getting out of it. Now I got a uh, temporary, temporary shroud replacement. And yeah, it's definitely not something I feel good about, but I think it'll work. she holding? Sure does. 
All right, welcome to La Bodega of Captain John from Second Star. Um, actually, when we first got to Isla Mujeres, Jordan and John started working together on a bunch of projects. Eventually, John ended up getting this little teeny um, workspace uh, worked out at one of the marinas here, and it's pretty sweet. Um, and then he's really great. He and Eon are just like magicians when it comes to organization. So um, I just think it's so cool how this was literally just an empty room and they've made it so functional. He's got all of his uh, tubing there, all of his tools back there. Got a nice compressor right here, which we've borrowed a couple times. Um, all of his paints back there. Once Jordan started working with Captain John, um, he also kind of put me in touch with a bunch of people who needed canvas work. So um, John's pretty much single-handedly responsible for getting us a bunch of work uh, in Isla. So yeah, he's just such a cool guy and has he has his stuff figured out. Look at this place. Four years ago, if you told me I'd be impressed by <laughs> like a tool room or a shed or anything, I'd, I, I would probably not have believed you. But every time I come here, I'm like, wow, look at all this space. Look at all this organization. It's crazy. <laughs> and right now, Jordan is going to use a bodega to uh, work on our new shrouds. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to disassemble these uh, stay lock fittings. Um, and then we're going to replace the wire and then reassemble the stay lock fitting. So nice and simple. Okay, so there you have it. That's, uh, that's what it looks like disassembled. And, you know, we were a little curious as to like what the condition of the inside of these would be, if there'd be any corrosion whatsoever. And it looks like it's I mean, that looks pretty good to me. So that looks pretty good to me. There you go. Today is actually a pretty big day. We weren't even really talking about it like this, but this project is the last project on our must do before we can leave Isla list. So I got the shroud up and in place. Now I'm gonna put the turnbuckle on and attach it to the chain plate. But every time I get the opportunity now, I put a lana coat on the threads of turnbuckles. So anytime I'm adjusting them, taking them apart, um, and really that goes for just about anything with threads that's on deck anymore. Um, and uh, really keeps them from seizing up. Um, these, the body is made out of bronze, so I guess like galling isn't a problem, but still it's just one of those things where you want your turnbuckles to be easily adjustable, you know, in the long term, and this is the best way to guarantee that. Lanacote is a great product from my experience so far. Um, you know, it just does a good job of displacing salt water and you know fresh water like when you rinse or when it rains just doesn't really move it you know what i mean it just it's so sticky and goopy that it stays in place um and then it obviously if when when it, you're dealing with threads it gets into the threads um only the only downside is that it smells like sheep <laughs> like like sheep fat or shit or something um and so that can be kind of weird but other than that, I love this stuff.
now's the part where we pray that I got the length right. <laughs> that would suck. Although I can already tell. That's good. What you reading there, bud? I'm reading The Rigger's Apprentice by Brian Toss. Mm, what's the occasion? Uh, today I'm gonna do a uh, rig inspection. That book looks a little like it got a little bit wet. Oh, okay. Ironically, this book is all, you know, water damaged because we had a leaky chain plate. <laughs> it's called The Rigger's Apprentice. So it's pretty ironic to me. We fixed it, so don't worry. We're, we don't have leaky chain plates anymore. So I, we just, I just want to share a couple of the lessons I learned before I actually go up the mast. Um, one, uh, Toss talks about attitude, like your attitude that you should have when you go into uh, uh, your survey or, or your maintenance. And um, first of all, he says that you need to envision the rig as a whole. So you need to envision how the forces are going from you know, you steering the boat, adjusting the sails, the sails to the mast, the standing rigging, how they terminate everything. Um, because, you know, he was saying if you, if you really take a step back and look at it as a whole, it'll give you a, a better perspective to see potential problems. And then he really breaks down the main, like, concepts that you need to focus on when surveying your rig. Um, comes down to these four rules, and he actually adds a fifth. But I guess the four rules were created by yacht designer Eva Holman. Uh, one, if it is fastened, it will try to undo itself. So like fasteners like loosening or any kind of fastener whatsoever, loosening over time. Keep an eye out for that. Two, if it touches something, it will try to chafe itself or that other something to death. So that's a really good point. Um, like if you have any two things that are independent of each other touching, you could, you know, get a problem over time. Three. If it is slack, it will try to snag something. Um, and then four, if it is metal, it will try to corrode itself or its neighbor. So it's almost like having a really like pessimistic outlook on everything, right? Like, just don't trust it. If it's a screw, just assume it's loose, <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's touching something, assume that it's just gonna chafe until you have nothing left. Um, and then the fifth thing that he adds is fatigue. Like, look for metal fatigue. And uh, that specifically talks about cracking. So look for cracks in metal. Um, so anyway, we're gonna focus on that stuff as we look around the boat. And then finally, um, Toss ends this segment with this really cool conclusion. He says, sailing is surveying. And I'm just gonna read it. Um, he says, the best sailors notice things. Wind patterns on the water, how an engine sounds, the shape of a sail, the shape of a cloud. By noticing, they have a greater reference base and can act quickly and appropriately when they need to. When we call, sur or I'm sorry, what we call surveying is really just a formal exercise in noticing things. So get formal for your surveys, but consider living every day by another of Miss Holman's maxims. Feel, rattle, pull, knock, and touch absolutely everything. And I, that's just great. Like, in so many ways, rigging and most, I mean, so much boat stuff, like surveying, like, seems so scientific and so, like, can feel so overwhelming that things like this really, like, make me feel a little bit more empowered about what I can find and how I can look for problems. Feel, rattle, pull, knock, and touch absolutely everything. Looking good, bud. Thanks. It's a nice look. look. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, tie it off. I'm just gonna keep inspecting, and as I th see things, can you write them down? So, 
spinnaker halyard block corroding from contact with four stay tang. All right, looks pretty good. such a funny thing to do at anchor you know I'm trying to focus on one thing and it's just like my whole world is just like moving you know, there's definitely some crazy shit going on there just where the stainless meets the aluminum As you can see with this toggle, this is uh, the the lower stay, the lower shrouds on the port side, and most of the toggles sort of tend to favor the outboard side. Well, this this one toggle, this forward toggle, it's favoring inboard, and because of that, it's pushing against the the mast, um, and so right there where it's touching the mast, that's where there's some corrosion happening. So we've got Desiree down below. She's gonna loosen that shroud, and I'm gonna push that away from the mast. Right there is where you can see there's a little bit of damage done to the mast uh, from that clevis pin right there. And so it's good that we moved it when we did, but it's all good now. I went to the internet today, went to go do some research on hurricanes and hurricane holes in the Caribbean and, and particularly like hurricane tracks by month. When you go onto Noah's like historical like hurricane track site, mm -hmm. like it's terrifying because you're <laughs> like, I want to know, and again, they have they have records from 1850, and so you're just like, well, okay, I want to know about all the hurricanes that have affected this area, and it's like, Bwong! and you're like, whoa, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> you know, yeah. and you're just, and they show lines, but there's like so many of them that you're like, I, I don't even know, like, like what to do here, you know, and I was researching like hurricane holes. I'm like, you know, there just aren't that many good ones But really the forecasting is only accurate 48 hours in advance And so I was doing a lot of research online and like what most people's opinion is is like you need to have a 24-hour bailout option, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And if and if it's not within 24 hours like it's then it's not a good option, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, yeah, that's a really good point, you know mm -hmm. to be honest like Belize is cool. We tell you, you could do that in like the June, July time, you know. But where's the hurricane hole? There isn't really one in Belize, but like you're you're in the off season. Yeah, you know I mean like you're yes, you're in hurricane season, but it's not. The odds are still quite low. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I want I want to say like something like seventy five percent, eighty percent maybe mm -hmm. occur between. August and October. July doesn't really, July sees an average of 0.7 named systems per year, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's including the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So you're saying we can go to Belize, spend like... We, we could leave here and sail south. Uh -huh. We could do a little bit of Belize and then we could spend three months in the Rio. August, September, October. I don't, I don't October. mind spending time in the Rio. Like, Uma said they loved it there. 
I think we would like it there. I think but, we, we would find a way to like it. Yeah, it just hurts me to suggest that we're gonna hunker down after this much time hunkered down. Oh well, but like, I, I mean... Yeah, cry me a river. So I've actually been thinking in the back of my head about doing the like traditional Rio route and you know, waiting out the hurricane season there and then starting to cruise after that. And I, I didn't tell you because I knew that you were really averse to the idea. Um, but I'm happy that, you know, you oh. spoke with Tracy and Steve about it and kind of considered it for one of the first times. And I don't know, I guess I'm just at a point in our cruising career where I'm kind of like, if, if we're invested to cruise for the next 10 years and like have a life on this boat and have a kid on this boat, like we just need to focus on making each other happy and like learning as much as we can and practicing and getting the boat ready. And like, yes, it's frustrating that we've missed the last two cruising seasons because we've been doing, uh, making, making money, doing other people's boat work and then getting to our own boat work like we can't just I, I don't think it's a good idea to start cruising in hurricane season because of that you know like that seems a little hasty to me if we do it that's fine actually like I'll I'll support the idea and you know we'll, we'll go to Cuba and and wherever we end up after that but the idea of like taking the easy way out you know, going to Rio and waiting out the season, or going to Belize and then going to Rio, like, it, it's not the end of the world to me because just because hundreds of other boats do this, like, our need to, like, feel adventurous and, like, feel like we're doing something different than everyone else is, I think, like, a little immature, you know, like, we can still go to the Rio and and do it differently than most people. Like we can still have an amazing time. We can get the boat ready. We can like really get ahead on episodes. We can have some like relaxed time where we're actually enjoying ourselves and getting work done without this like frantic idea of like, we need to get out of here. We need to get out of here. So I really don't think going to the Rio for, you know, three months and waiting out the hurricane season getting stuff done, like balancing ourselves and just like getting mentally prepared to actually cruise in the ideal cruising season wouldn't, I don't think that'd be a bad idea at all. I think that'd be like welcomed, you know? I hear you, homie. It's a good point. Thanks, homie. All right, well, you want to go to Belize? Yeah, let's go to Belize. Remember we were so excited about diving there? Yeah. In June, July time, like it's it's gonna be beautiful. Snail. Damn. Nice one, bro. <laughs> Like rain coming in through your leaky chain plate, getting your rigging book all soaking wet. And isn't it ironic? 